You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You are now entering the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, a show that uncovers what's fact, what's fake, and what's fun in the crazy world of pseudo archaeology. Hello and welcome to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 123, and I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and tonight we talk about my ascendancy to fame as part of Wired's Archaeology Support. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. It's nice to be here, and I thought today I would go over this experience that I had about, well, really several months ago, it came in stages. And that experience was to be the host of Wired Supports Archaeology YouTube video. Now, this is part of the Wired YouTube channel, and I think they have like 11 million subscribers or something like that. They are a huge channel. And they got in touch with me to do a piece on archaeology. And the setup is that they take the most common questions from the internet and really mostly from Twitter. And they have a specialist answer these questions, right? So they picked me as the specialist. And I know some of you are probably really interested in how you become kind of a media spokesperson. And I thought I would just go over this entire process. So for today, I thought I'd start with talking about the Wired shoot itself, how I got it, how it went, what happens once the video is released to the public. And then after that, I would talk about the comments. I think online at this point, there's over 8,000 comments on that video. And I've tried to answer a big portion of them, of course, I can't answer 8,000 comments, but I did my best to sort of interact with that audience. And I will say that the comments overall were massively positive. So with what comes next, I don't want you guys to think that it was a downer or something like that. Like it got very positive feeling behind it, which was which was really nice and made me feel good. But of course, there were some detractors. And why were there detractors? Well, because one or two of the questions that people had centered around pseudo archaeology. So you can see why this works perfect for this podcast. And I answered those questions as plainly and as straightforward as I could, trying to not make fun of anyone, but answering those pseudo archaeology questions really straightforwardly. And of course I got some, well, I made some people really angry and you know, sometimes they write in all capital letters. (laughs) So we'll discuss that. We'll explore that. And then finally, maybe a few tips and tricks. Like if this happens to you, how to deal with people who just hate your guts because you said something that they are just, that they disagree with. Anyway, how did I get this job and how did this go? So I've been really focused on what we vaguely call public archaeology for years now. And really in the last mm, five or six years, I've really made a concentrated, focused effort to bring archaeology to the general public. And that is with my YouTube channel, Kinkella Teaches Archaeology. That is with getting an agent in the media world. Past Preservers is my agency, and they get offers sometimes for programs like this, and I go through them. And then podcasts like this, you know, so I'm always pushing to get archaeology out to the general public and to use just regular language and talk in an everyday way and talk about the fun and exciting parts. I just I I love it. You guys, it's like my favorite part of archaeology is bringing it to the public. Anyway, jobs like this wired job often come through my agent, like he'll see a job or a job will come through him and he'll think of me as a possible fit 
This one, I think I got emailed. They emailed me straight. One of the producers at Wired just emailed me and they said, hey, we've seen your YouTube videos. Um, we think you would be good for this. What happens then? Whether you go through an agent or not, and I recommend going through an agent when in doubt, is that these days they will tend to set up a Zoom meeting. And this is and by they, I mean the production company. In this instance, it would be Wired. But I've done a ton of these, you guys, and they they all vaguely follow this script. So you have a Zoom meeting and the Zoom meeting is really just to see if you're a fit and the producer will be there or a casting director or this kind of thing on the other side. Then they ask you general questions about yourself, about archaeology, you know, and you just answer them as best you can. And they usually are recording it because they're going to show it to the rest of the production people later, like to the director and so on to see if you're right or not. Now, you guys, I have lost a million and one of these jobs. That's the that's the daily battle of the actor, you know, so you can't let it get to you. I will say when I had my initial Zoom meeting and it was about 45 minutes, a bit longer than usual, I didn't think it went that great. You know, I just I was talking with the casting director and it wasn't that it was bad. It's just sometimes you have that sixth sense of like, well, I, I don't think that went too hot. You know, you just you just do. We had our meeting and then he said, you know, thanks. We'll get in touch with you. And I'm like, great. And then like a month went by and I heard nothing. And I thought that was uh, par for the course. Again, you lose a ton of jobs doing this kind of stuff. It just doesn't work out. No harm, no foul. But then I got an email and they're like, you're it, you're in, we're going to shoot. What do you think? You know, and that was really great. I'm like, wow. You know, it was surprising. I, I didn't think I had it. I didn't feel super, super confident. And, and of course, I have stories that go the other way, too, where I've been super confident and then didn't get the job. And I was shocked. It, it, you never know. You never know what the other side wants. Anyway, the setup was that I would come to their offices, which happened to be in L.A., and show up there early in the morning for a shoot that was about, oh, I think it was about three and a half hours long, which is on the short side. I've been on these before you guys where they're like 12 hours long, like brutal days. And when you walk in, there's really just a chair and sometimes a table, sometimes not. And then cameras and lights all pointed at you. So you're literally just like sitting in this chair and then they just start asking you questions. Now, Common question I get is, do you know the questions beforehand and or do you have a script? Do you have a script? The answer is no. Uh, sometimes they'll have like kind of a beat sheet of topics they want to hit or little like little phrases they might need for editing purposes. But it's really up to you. So even before I got there, they did send me like 100 questions. I went through all of them. I answered them to the best of my ability just for myself. I emailed them back like, I think these questions are good. I think these questions don't work so hot. And then took what I said seriously, but they also have a bottom line. And maybe some of those questions that I didn't think were so great, they still needed to have done. My point being, there's a lot of work behind the scenes, even before you get to the shoot. You really have to know your stuff. You really have to know what you're going to say. So I had no idea which of those 100 questions, literally 100 questions that they were going to use. I got there and they were very nice, very professional. It was great. I mean, behind the scenes, the wired people, they know what they're doing. They deserve their 11 million you know, plus followers. They were only professional. They set me up and then they just started asking me questions. Now, I would say that 85 percent of them were from the list, you know. Oh, hey, what do you think of this? And, and I was fairly ready. But as you can see in the video, I'm answering off the top of my head. I am not reading a script in any way. I am looking at the person who asks and then I'm talking, which gives it a life to it. Right. Which gives it a liveliness. And you want that. You know, you don't want some weirdo just reading a script. Oh, it'd be so odd. So there's an energy to it. And then about maybe 15% of the questions I hadn't seen or they had just found or they, they would run it by me. They'd be like, hey, what do you think of this one? And I'd always just be like, hey, let's try it. You know, so they did ask me all kinds of questions. So even though it's only three and a half hours, you are working for three and a half hours, man. You are on camera. You are asking questions. You're making sure you're sitting right. You're making sure the sound's OK. Right. You are kind of angling correctly. So you look normal. <laughs> and 
I love doing this kind of work, but it is a lot of work. Anyone who is getting into this must take it absolutely seriously, must be a consummate professional themselves and know the stuff cold. So you can say it four different ways, you know, in terms of what I wore or what to wear to these kind of things. Every time I've ever done it, it's been my own clothes. And they just give general parameters, you know, don't wear anything with stripes or whatever. So I tend to just wear things that I like or I feel comfortable in. For the wired shoot, they really wanted me to wear a hat. And I felt kind of weird wearing a hat, especially indoors. But I understand why, because if you look at these videos, every time that there's a specialist, they're always kind of clothed in what they wear on the job like they've had doctors on there like medical doctors and they'll be wearing you know the whites and and so on right the the doctor's robe and that kind of thing so i was cool with that and then we just we just shot you know just question after question after question what you finally see of course is only a very small percentages of the total of what was asked right and Again, man, I only got good things to say about the Wired production team. I thought they picked the best of the best. I thought they made me look great. I mean, when I watched it, I was I was only happy. I was kind of like, yes, because you never know what the production company is going to pick. I've done enough of these kind of things where sometimes I'll watch something and I always have a little trepidation watching myself. I feel odd about it. Sometimes I wait a really long time before there's certain things I've been in. I've never watched at all just because I've been slightly like worried. (laughs) I'm sure I'll watch it in time, but you might have done certain things that you thought were really great. And then they don't pick those and they pick the like two shots that you thought weren't that great. But you have to realize it's for a larger project. You are just a very small part of a much larger project. And that's how the system works. You just do your best and then you move on. And I think one thing that's really difficult, especially for young people getting into this or new people getting into this, is you're constantly worried about saying something wrong. You know, it's like that they'll ask you something in my case about archaeology and you like won't know it or or your answer that you think is right is actually kind of wrong Or something like that. And my big advice is don't worry about it. Because what you're worrying about is that your professor's listening or something. Uh, You know, some archaeologists are listening or something, but they're not the audience. The general public is the audience. You will get detractors from the academic world. You always will. And it's just something you have to deal with. And and I'm embarrassed for those people and my meaning there is academics who piss on other academics who choose to put their best foot forward and go up into the public world i hate it when academics eat their own and you really see that when another academic like myself chooses to do this kind of stuff and so if you want to go into this world You just have to be cool with the knowledge that those small people will get down on you and you just have to shine it on and keep going because you're doing something that's incredibly important. When we come back, the comments on the Wired video. Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 123. I am your host yet again, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and we have been talking about my appearance on the Wired Support video for archaeology. And with this segment, I thought I would talk about the comments. 8.8 thousand of them. (laughs) So first, I do want to reiterate that the comments were overwhelmingly positive. And that made me feel really good. Like people who just wrote simple things like, oh, really great video. Thanks. I mean, I'm telling you, man, it makes it all worth it. People would also ask like follow up questions. And that was awesome, too. And I tried to do my best to get to as many as I could. I also saw some people saying that, oh, it's really great that the host of one of these wired videos actually was in the comment section. 
So I, I understand that sometimes people can't do that or whatever. They get big names. I They had Mark Hamill on like two weeks before me, you know? So when you're competing with Luke Skywalker, I mean, dude, you're going to come in second. I really, again, enjoyed those comments. They really do ma- make me feel good. They're really sort of, they're really nice. Of course, on the flip side, there were some angry people. Oh, yeah. No, a few, but I guess they were mighty and strong. And, you know, people like this will comment like 20 times, you know, because they have to have their tantrum. I wrote down a handful of some of my favorites, and I thought we could analyze these and talk about, you know, in the world of pseudo-archaeology, how to equip yourself or acquit yourself when you are having to deal with this. And with the realization of... You can't just keep interacting with these people because it will never end. So here are some fun ones. Now, overall, I thought the video was really pretty neutral, if that makes sense. I mean, I took the questions and I answered them to the best of my ability, like full stop. I wasn't trying to push an agenda. (laughs) I just I love even saying the term push an agenda. (laughs) secretly I was pushing an agenda. No, I was just answering questions, right? As an archaeologist. And so many of them, it's so funny, you guys, when you do this, some things that you think are totally neutral, like people will get pissed at. My, my first favorite one is at one point someone asked, do you think that there's going to be like more or fewer archaeological sites found in the, in the next like 30 years? And I said, oh, I think there's going to be more found because of overpopulation. We are building more and more. We're like, you know, we're disturbing more soil. So just because we're digging more, we're going to find more stuff. Right. And then I just moved on to the next question. Several people online were like, oh, I was into it until he said overpopulation. I'm like, what? What? And I even asked one of these people. I was like, I just have to ask. What's the deal with over the word overpopulation? Like, I don't get it. It seems totally neutral to me. And they said that, well, we could tell that you were dog whistling to your base. I'm like, <laughs> I'm dog whistling to my, yeah, my base. Dude. Yeah, because I'm running for president. <laughs> like, what? Like, I, I didn't get it. I mean, I get what... Dog whistling is sort of, you know, kind of secretly speaking to your base. And so the idea is that if you say the world is overpopulated, that that's wrong because the world is not overpopulated. It's just bad government and use of resources. And it's like, oh, dude. Yes, yes, yes. I get it. Yes, there. Of course, governments could do better. We could do better in terms of allocating resources. But can you find me that? extra source of fresh water oh wait there isn't one you know what i mean i mean that's what happens when you get into this world people will bitch at you for saying the word overpopulation whatever so that that's that's one what what else do i got oh i got this like a bunch of times like what was your favorite archaeological site found in the last five years and i talked about like richard the third and i talked about the endurance um ernest shackleton ship which I thought were great. And and somebody was pissed that I didn't pick Gobekli Tepe. That's one of the Graham Hancock people's big things. Oh, Gobekli Tepe. But what about Gobekli Tepe? Archaeologists so wrong about Gobekli Tepe. And it's like, dude, we're not wrong about Gobekli Tepe. Like, Tepe. And what's funny is this dude it was wrong in several ways. First, Gobekli Tepe wasn't even found in the last five years. It was found decades ago. So it wouldn't even count in the first place. Secondly, Archaeologists are doing just fine with the Gobekli Tepe. We like Gobekli Tepe. I did an entire podcast on Gobekli Tepe, right? But this never ending push of like archaeologists have it wrong. And that's what you'll find with so many of these. What these people also do is they constantly say, please explain. You need to explain. You need to give reasons why you said Graham Hancock was baseless. You need to give your reasons. The reasons have been given four billion and one times with these people. Even if you say like, hey, just Google this or hey, watch my show on Gobekli Tepe. They never do. Never, ever. They just bitch 
they never actually do the slight work, which is click on this YouTube link and listen. They never do. They just go back and they, I'm telling you guys, they say the same things over and over. One of my big notes to the keyboard warriors out there is please just read some of the other comments before you comment. Because I got the Gobekli Tepe thing like, I don't know, a dozen times. Well, he didn't talk about Gobekli Tepe. It's like, dude, the show's only 15 minutes long. <laughs> oh, man. And also, the, I think I might have actually answered that question at some point. But in the production of the video, the Wired crew used the best questions and Gobekli Tepe just wasn't one of them. Understandable. That's one of my biggest complaints, honestly, about the pseudo archaeology crowd and the pro Graham Hancock people is they they always say, please explain, explain, please explain, please explain. And then they just never listen when you do. It's like, I'm not your mommy. Like, you need to Google explanation Gobekli Tepe. It's all you need to do. And then it's out there. We've all done it. There's multiple you know, I'm not even going to put these in the comments. You can go, you can Google it. <laughs> it's like, it's fine. But, but the, the problem is they just won't change their mind in any way. Another thing I got, of course, is that I'm, I'm not funny. And of course, when you get, when somebody keeps saying you're not funny, it means you're totally funny and that you totally hit a nerve and they don't like it. Oh, I got multiple times. Well, as soon as he made fun of Graham Hancock, I was out. And it's like, no, one of the questions was on the Piri Rees map. And the producers decided to keep that one. And it, it was, you know, can you tell us about the Piri Rees map? And the Piri Rees map, again, I have another complete episode on the Piri Rees map that, you know, I spent 40 minutes or whatever talking about the specifics of that and how Graham Hancock's idea of the Pee Wee Rees map is showing a part of Antarctica is ludicrous. Whenever I explain why, which is really easy, it's like, well, it's a map where it has a portion of South America that just curves around the bottom of the page. If you look at it closely, you can tell the various inlets and stuff. The whole thing is South America. The geography, they just never respond to that. They just keep going. And you didn't explain yourself. It's again, a common thing. You just did explain yourself. And then they go, you didn't explain. Again, it's because they will never change their mind. I got this. He's obviously reading a script. <laughs> I mean, those of you who are fans of mine, does it ever for a moment feel anywhere? My YouTube channel, you know, anywhere. This, that I'm reading a script. You think I have time to write a script? Like, oh, dude, come on. Like, they were they were like, he obviously looked up and to the right at the script. <laughs> like, what? I didn't. Oh, man. And, and, and using that, too, as a hit against me. Well, he's just reading a script. <laughs> I did get a comment that I was too loud. I get that I get. I did warn the sound person, honestly, before we rolled. I'm like, I have a really loud voice. I can't help it. Like, turn this stuff way down. But there's a there's a shouting aspect to sort of how I talk. And and I just I'm just sorry about that. There's nothing I can do if if I lower that, then I lower my energy at the same point. So uh, that again, I'm always fine with criticisms. That's fine. You know, it's just the the ones we're laughing at that I am not fine with are the stupid pseudo archaeology stuff. Let's see. What, what else do I got? Uh, there's there's just so much here, you guys. There's so much. Oh, somebody did tell me to repent to Jesus Christ. So I got to get on that. You know, one that really bummed me out. There was obviously it was like a young woman and she was really into archaeology. And she'd ask me something like, hey, how do I get into archaeology? You know, a question I get all the time. And I was really happy to reply to her. But before I could even get to her, some total asshole was just like, well, get ready to lie for the rest of your life. A troll, just trolling a young person who's curious about archaeology. Man, what a just pure asshole. And, you know, I just didn't even take that one. And I, and I just responded to her. And I was like, well, there's lots of ways to do it. It's a, it's a viable career. Oh, I hate that. I hate people like that. Why, why are you so bitter? Why do you have so much poison in your soul? You know? 
Oh, some people had their own finds that they wanted to talk about. I found the entrance to a to a pyramid, to a tomb, you know, and it's like those are like, no, you know, <laughs> here's one. Let's see. I, I, I wrote it down. Somebody wrote, quote, science has a history of being absolute in an opinion only to be proven incorrect over time. Hancock's assertions aren't baseless. And rather than just diminishing them, surely it's worth investigating further. That quote just sums it up, right? Because it's just full of BS. So, quote, science has a history of being absolute in an opinion only to be proven incorrect over time. No, it doesn't. Think about how many times science is right. Think about how many times. uh, How is your life improved by science, right? Uh, In like every way. You're alive because of science, you know, so th- so the idea that that science is like always proven incorrect, that's the way science works. If something is proven incorrect, then you come up with something else that's better. That's the joy of it. So, you know, this idea that oh, science is wrong, but Graham Hancock's crap is right. And, and Hancock's assertions aren't baseless. Yes, they are baseless. <laughs> yes, they are. They're not kind of baseless. They're not mostly baseless. They are 100 percent baseless. They are made up. The Piri Reis map showing Antarctica, that is made up bullshit, not kind of right. That's what the, that's the stuff that's so crazy. And rather than just dismissing them, no, we need to dismiss them and go, what a bunch of crap. Surely it's worth investigating further. No, it's not. It's be- See, the point is it's been investigated. And this is their point. You can investigate the Piri Reis thing. And what you do is you look at a map of South America and you go, oh, it fits. Oh, it's South America. The end. You don't need to investigate further. (laughs) It's obvious. I had people telling me that I was wrong in this archaeology stuff and I need to explain how the pyramids align to the stars. They don't. Oh, that that I can never say it never happened. Yes, I can. Did aliens come? No, because it never happened. (laughs) I said it. It never happened. See, I'm going to say it a bunch of times. Oh, watch me. Oh, right. And this idea that I that in order to bring people in, I have to a- approach crazy pseudo archaeology ideas as if they could be possible. That is a terrible mistake. I will never do that because you're just giving credit to baseless bullshit. You can't do that. That that's just treating people like children. Like, well, maybe. No, maybe there's aliens. No, there's not. The amount of evidence is zero. We need to be grown-ups when we talk about this, right? So, no, I will never do that, right? Well, you must approach, oh, well, maybe it's oh, well, you no, it's a really good idea. You had a really good idea there, Jim. You had a great, it's okay. No, we're adults. We can talk about how certain things are impossible. <laughs> Oh, oh, and of course, the Ice Age thing. Here's a direct quote when talking about the super civilization of the previous Ice Age, the Graham Hancock, you know, crazy super civilization thing. Quote, the evidence is all over the planet. No, it's not. (laughs) See, I so if somebody says that, I can't be like, well, it could be all over the planet. No, it's not. We're adults. Nothing. Again, you guys, these are all just I just picked and choose some quotes from the comments. Now, because so many of these were negative, again, you might think that everything was terrible or something. It wasn't. There's thousands of great ones. These are just ones that I cherry picked, you know, to show that these people are always around and will never go away. When we return, some tips and tricks for dealing with this stuff. Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 123. I am still your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and we have been talking about my experiences on the Wired Archaeology support video and dealing with uh, some of the negative comments. Now, we can have fun with one or two more of those in a minute, but I thought at the top of this, I would talk about how to deal with negative comments in the first place. And In terms of what to do, I think it's really important to engage with these people unless it's super negative, unless they're just spilling hate on you. Then you can just let it go. Then don't engage. But what I do is I give them the benefit of the doubt and then I will answer their question one time and I will answer it in a relaxed manner 
I will answer it in a very open manner, in a very welcoming manner. Like, come in, come over. The water's fine. Come, let's let's do this, you know, in that way. So I will, again, doing that, giving the benefit of the doubt and being kind like that, that really helps, you know, because you don't want to be just some negative head up their ass academic, you know, trying to make people feel stupid. Like that's horrible. You don't want to do that. So I always give one pass if that makes sense. And, and I will just, I will answer the question completely. And again, in a jovial, lighthearted, welcoming manner, 95% of the time it doesn't work at all. And they come back with, well, what about the alignment of the pyramids? You don't know. And then at that point, I don't discuss anymore. And if they're too cruel and over the top, I will make fun of them. That's the the balance. It, it, but I won't spend time. I will do one laugh track comment at their expense. And then I'll move on with my life because they will always come back. They never stop. So you want to balance this as much as you can. Think of your own safety. You don't want to, you know, anger people too hor- terribly much. But a little smack on the top of the head, you know, is I find it a good thing in doing so much of this, this media stuff and talking with the public, the big question comes up of should we as professional archaeologists engage with the pseudo archaeology crowd, like the Graham Hancocks of the world and that kind of stuff. A lot of professional archaeologists and a lot of academics A lot of academic archaeologists say no. They say that we shouldn't. We're just platforming them and we shouldn't sort of dirty ourselves. I totally disagree. They have the platform. We have totally lost. Academic archaeology has done a total crap job of bringing it out to the public. And so many of the academics look like cliche academics in the worst sense. And a lot of them are. So should we interact with the Graham Hancocks of the world? Absolutely. Because the Graham Hancocks of the world have won. I mean, have you seen ancient apocalypse? That was the number one rated show on Netflix. Now we can bitch and moan about that, but it's the truth because professional archeologists for generations have left a hole in the public consciousness and we have not filled it. So you get all this like BS crap that comes in to fill it instead. The public is interested in what we do. So we need to do it. Yeah. Look again, I can't, I can't reiterate this enough. The platform is lost. The pseudo archeologists have it. Look at the number of books they sell versus the number of books we sell. There is no comparison. They won. So It's like I get these questions like, oh, Kinkella, would you go on the Joe Rogan show with Graham Hancock in a minute? Yes, because that gets us uh, uh, to claw back onto that platform a little bit. You know, Uh, again, I get I get pushback from this from time to time. But man, I know I'm right. I know I'm right on this. one. I've thought about it a lot, you guys, because I get it. I get the other side. I get saying that that they don't want to engage. I I get that there's there's a perceived loss there in just the engagement, but the perceived loss is only perceived by academics. And academics are not the audience. The audience is the general public. The general public sees the non-engagement as being a bunch of chicken shits. And they're kind of right. You know what I mean? So Yes. And so if there's anything I would say, I would say everyone engage, engage everywhere, engage all the time, push back all the time. Right. You have to get back up on the platform because it's lost. So engagement is only good. It's like being a politician who says they will only go on Fox or only go on CNN. No way. If I was a politician, I'd go on any radio, television, podcast, all of it. Right. Because ultimately that's very inclusive. And that's what you want to do. You want to reach out. So I am I am a big fan of that. Right. So just please, 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 everyone do engage. Don't be afraid, even though I know it can be frightening, but just go for it. And I think I think one of the hard parts is that fear, because 
when you deal with the pseudo crowd, they don't need to know anything because their stories are baseless. They're made up. The Pee Wee Reeves map showing Antarctica, it doesn't. So they can just bullshit with whatever they want. You have to know everything and you can't. So you're always already at a disadvantage, but you just do your best and you don't let up and you give them no inch. You just go, boom, this is this is this is the facts. This is the facts. This is the facts. And if they go, well, you don't know, you go, yes, I do. Right. You push and push and push. And I want to see more of that because we are we are behind. And so I thought I'd end here, though, with two just fun quotes and the first one is uh, somebody wrote to me, I respect him, but he perpetuated what butt munch archaeologists and gaslighters say about Graham. Graham never claimed to be an archaeologist, so to call him a pseudo archaeologist is massively insulting. Plus, Graham isn't here to state his real points. And my response just was, my favorite part of this is that it starts with, I respect him. <laughs> See, this is so typical. It's just it's all just BS nothing. Like Graham never claimed to be an archaeologist. That's his big trick, of course. You know, he talks about how he's not an archaeologist. So what am I supposed to do? Just let him roll? Oh, well, he's not an archaeologist, so he can just say his baseless horseshit. <laughs> and then and then finally, let's go with this. And remember, if you guys want to get into the public media world, you will have to deal with this, but please deal with it and be on my team. Here, here it goes. A reader wrote, genuinely disappointed that there are people like this teaching at high levels in our world. A hundred points for passion, zero for academic rigor and scientific thought. A truly deadly combination. Genuinely no longer feel as much regret for not having gone into this awesome field. <laughs> he didn't like me very much. So I wrote, when unknown keyboard warrior tells you that you have no academic rigor or scientific thought, it's definitely time to hang your PhD up and forget about your three decades of field research. And with that, I'll see you guys next time. And I do want to give a special thanks to the Wired team, and I will link my Wired episode below. See you later. Thanks for listening to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast. Please like and subscribe wherever you like and subscribe. And if you have questions for me, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, feel free to reach out using the links below or go to my YouTube channel, Kinkella Teaches Archaeology. See you guys next time. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.